I'd like to welcome everybody for joining us today, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Anissa Betia, and I am the uh, Think Tank Program Coordinator for the Global Research Network. Uh, the Global Research Network is an organization um, that's very unique. Uh, we are active on an active online meeting place for early career faculty, researchers, and doctoral students. Our members are from a truly global and diverse range of backgrounds and higher educational institutions. And our common goal is collabor collaboration, which is needed more than ever as our greatest problems of the day transcend narrow fields of work. The GRM provides a kind of interdisciplinary and inclusive space facilitating long-term friendships, creative thinking, and genuine career support. Members are invited to reach out across national and international borders uh, to share our life experiences, study, and practice. Our Think Tank program acknowledges that the environmental, economic, political, and social crises we face today have one thing in common. They are replicated in every jurisdiction and are produced by forces that extend globally. And as such, they require deep analysis, lateral thinking, and innovative self problem solving. It is with the spirit that we are pleased to welcome, welcome you and thank you for joining us for this book talk with Hassan al -Kunar. Today, he will present his book, Man at the Airport, to you because the topics and themes he touches on are not only relevant to our think tanks on war, conflict, global migration, human rights, gender and family, because he offers a perspective that is often lacking in one of the most contentious topics of our day, migration. He illustrates the disparities in the asylum system and the lack of basic human rights by telling a story within a story, like Russian nesting dolls, that captures displacement, displacement inequity, the dysfunction of asylum and immigration law, the role of border sovereignty, national security, in creating refugees and displacement, racism, and the power of people. He teaches the reader about hope and the importance of allowing refugees to frame their own stories. He tells the story from within a system and offers a unique and important ins insights. His narrative presents that he presents is not only thoughtful and raw because it draws upon his own lived experiences and he provides a reader with the opportunity to inhabit his own, his, his world. Yet, it is not only his story, but it's also emblematic of what many Syrians endured and by extension is similar and dissimilar to other refugee populations. I'd like to introduce you to our author today. Hassan is a Syrian who became a refugee after he was unable to renew his passport while living in the United Arab Emirates. His story went viral after he was trapped in the airport in Malaysia. And it was by using social media that he was able to ultimately seek asylum in Canada. Hassan is currently working for the Red Cross in Canada and the man at the airport is his first book. And what, is there anything else you would like to add about your background? I like that it's my first book. It's like uh, implying that I'm gonna write uh, another one. I'm not sure of that. We're, we're hoping. <laughs> It's just the first and maybe the last book. So, yeah. No, I think you did a great job. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So, I'll go ahead and ask the first question. Sure. So, I, I want to start off by asking you what was your motivation? Because, you know, writing a book is not an easy task, finishing <laughs> a book is not an easy task. So, you know, what, what kept you going? And second, if <clears throat> If your book could have an impact or impacts on the world, what would you hope that would be? And what would it look like? The impact is the motive, actually. The impact I was looking for is the motive itself. Uh, it's not right. Uh, it's not easy to uh, to write a book. That's true. Uh, it turned out to be uh, one of the hardest things I did. Why I did it? Because... After I arrived to Canada, I uh, and whenever people ask me where I'm from, and I will say originally from Syria, and they will start, oh, I'm sorry, will try to show their empathy and sympathy. 
Uh, they know a big deal about the Syrian war, but uh, they don't know anything about Syria, the country, even before the war or the civilization. Who are we as Syrians? What our life looked like, uh, our dreams, our families, our daily life. So I wanted to introduce us. I want them to hear from us directly because after 2011, and when the Syrian war started, uh, they had the, the media created this uh, stereotype, a pattern about Syrians. Whenever you think about Syria, you will think about refugee camps and educated people, uh, dirty kids, uh, uh, tents, no health care, vulnerable people, people who are uh, shouting out loud, asking or crying for help. When it's not the truth, the Syrian are uh, um, an educated, skilled worker and people and whatever the community they are living in, uh, they would be a great uh, add to that uh, and uh, a new value to that community. So I wanted them to hear from us directly. Uh, I, want them, uh, I wanted them to know about Syria before the war, Syria the civilization, Syria the country. And uh, I, I wanted to bring the gap closer between our two nations, the West and the East, um, uh, to, to create a new pattern. Uh, th that was my motive. I was into writing since I was a child. I loved writing and uh, I was hesitating. Uh, the, uh, I was worried about the outcome. Uh, what if the book failed? What if I did not manage to uh, deliver the message? Why I, uh, because I have this in my personality, I normally try to explain things, but I end up complicating it because of the idea in my head. So I tend to speak too much because I don't want people to misunderstand me or because I want to make myself clear. Um, then I discovered that writing is uh, therapeutic, actually. Um, there was, uh, I was working uh, in Whistler at that time, uh, nine to 10 hours a day, a day. Uh, but the book was a dream uh, because uh, I wanted to answer the questions. Uh, mm -hmm. in both personal level and uh, general level. And, and that's why also the impact of the word, to hear from us directly, to know us and to give us a chance. And you, you really did accomplish that. It, it, it was no easy feat to include not only that, that micro level that we were talking about before, before the, we opened up the, the room of you just providing these little details, especially you're, you're bringing your father and your family and just those, those intimate details uh, really made it easy to grasp who you were. And, by, and, and then also the greater idea of, of, of who Syrians were before this conflict. So that, that was really powerful, as well as bringing you in to show the, the, the macro level uh, geopolitical um, influences that were driving your your life trajectory. So well, I'm, so glad, I'm so glad you, you you did write it, and it's such a masterful piece of, of piece of work. And and I'm I I I'm a uh, literature major, so I've I've read lots of books. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I mean it, it's just this. It was simplistic in the sense that it reduced a very complex idea into something that you could anyone could understand. Well, I, I'm, uh, English is not my first language. And I first, I, I faced some difficulties writing the book because, um, and I explained that at the uh, introduction of the book that I don't look like a writer or an author. I don't use the big words the same way they do. But uh, at the same time, I felt that uh, I'm about to, uh, uh, to leave my legacy behind. Uh, the idea of we will all be uh, far gone from this world one day, uh, we will be no longer exist, but there is a piece of us, uh, some, our words uh, uh, lay down on a shelf in a, a bookstore. Uh, that was intriguing for me. So I wanted to write uh, my story from all perspective. Uh, what do I think about love or God, peace, war, um, uh, the way I think so because I thought that it would be at one point my legacy and what I left behind. So uh, I tried to cover everything. I could not, but uh, uh, I wanted to humanize us because uh, 
we are still humans, but for governments or authorities or even some organization or people, we are a subject and we are a result of war uh, or we are uh, potential terrorists. So I wanted to humanize us. And we, look, you guys, uh, you have a family, mm -hmm. and we do have families, and you have kids, we do have kids, and we have the same dreams, the same hopes, the same way of life. Uh, that's what I was trying to do. And we know that as, as Syrians, uh, I, I try to make uh, my, my story um, more on a humanitarian level. But uh, as a Syrian, and uh, because of war, there is no way you could escape speaking about politics or geopolitics, because it is what caused all of that at the first place. So uh, you end up explaining about politics, even if you don't want to, because it's part of the story. Um, so that what happened. In my and they said kind of leads to the second, the second question where I, I think what you do really nicely is you you are bridging these two individual and geopolitical. And so my question, second question to you is, you know, in your book, you you continually emphasize the, the power individuals have in in affecting others' lives, especially you know to alter someone's life trajectory, uh, positively and negatively especially in your experience in you know, seeking asylum because it was in individuals who shaped where you ended up at, whether you were imprisoned or whether you were able to go to Canada. Um, you write of your own journey that, you know, iron will melt down at a certain temperature, but there is no breaking point for the human soul with a cause to fight for. Um, and I think that just kind of was the driving force of, of the book that this this took this this idea of you had a, a goal a mission, and you know what, what do you what do you mean that you know individuals individually and collectively make a change and and you you say you write uh, that you know we can beat the system, so could you explain that elaborate a little bit more? Well. Uh... It's something I rediscovered uh, or discovered when I was at the airport um, before or during my first month at the airport, or long before that, during the years of me being homeless, jobless, illegal, uh, uh, illegal immigrant or a refugee and oh, could not go back to my country because I'm wanted there. Uh, through all that years, I lost uh, hope uh, in, in humanity and I lost my faith and I started questioning my belief system. And I was almost, I was in my lowest and darkest moments, but uh, I was about to give up and um, I did not trust the people uh, close to me. They, they also walk away uh, because they have their own tragedy. So I end up losing uh, uh, almost all my friends and uh, uh, the people I know or depending on, I end up totally alone with nothing so i i kind of lost my hope in humanity but when i was at the airport and uh, long before that uh, the, the 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 individuals who has a certain amount of authority like uh, a police officer or uh, an airline uh, employee who decided not to board me uh, it fascinated me the the idea of how the system is designed the individual people who had uh, uh, authority to um, dead or live, uh, a death or li life decision. Uh, it's up, totally up to them. They don't look to you as a human. That's what the Turkey Airlines supervisor uh, did to me. He changed the course of my life uh, simply because I'm a Syrian. Uh, he did not allow me to, to board to the plane. Uh, he changed my life and he was acting uh, the authority the system gave him. Uh, he's still an individual. At the same time, um, uh, when I was at the airport, uh, uh, NGOs or UNHCR or governments, uh, uh, they said, sorry, we cannot help you. I was powerless. And most importantly, I was voiceless. When my story started to be known in the social media and the media, individuals from around the, the globe I never met uh, start to creating a wave and a type of pressure and I become uh, uh, having a voice, uh, and that's when the uh, when the uh, authorities uh, start paying attention, and they came and they changed all their uh, previous behaviors because I was protected. At that moment, I crossed from being uh, Hassan the 
a Syrian refugee or the powerless, hopeless, voiceless man to Hassan, the global citizen. Uh, they gave me a nationality, which is a humanitarian nationality. Uh, uh, they they uh, they supported me, and uh, with the help of the social media, I think we are living the future now, and uh, we are speaking the future language. We don't need to to write a sign to protest and go over outside to uh, under a heavy weather to protest. Uh, we can create the wave and be the change while we are living and enjoying our life in our living room. So that's what, how I felt that individuals are really, especially in the Western countries, because they have the democracy, they can vote and change government. They are the real source of uh, authorities and they can put up pressure. And even in English, they have a we don't have it in Arabic, but it's a, a lovely phrase, a lovely term uh, or expression. They they call it the court of public opinion. In uh, the Arabic word, we call it public opinion. Uh, we normally don't have it because we don't have human rights. But here they call it the court of public opinion. It is a court itself, and they will judge you as people, and they will hold your accountability at the, uh, the election time. That's why I felt that individual... Uh, they have the power to change. And that's what happened with me. Uh, uh, when my story become known, a group of individual people, retired people in Canada reached out to me and said, we are going to help you. It was not the Canadian government at the beginning. It was not the ministers or NGOs. It was people who are living, one of them, the main one living in a wooden cabin in, in Whistler, a, a retired woman. She, and she did all of that. That's why individual, and I still believe in that, they, they can change things. Yeah. And that's why you, and that's what you mean when you wrote that we can beat the system as individuals as acting. The, well, the, the system has been designed, uh, uh, and this is uh, from a personal experience when I was at the airport, as I told you, the, uh, they tried to convince me that uh, whatever we are offering you is your right as a human being, and you should take it and you should be thankful for it. I remember a call with UNHCR, which is the United Nations uh, Refugee Commissioner. Uh, we are the purpose of their existence and uh, as a refugees. Uh, they, she called me the lady there and said, uh, we cannot do anything for you. Uh, we advise you to turn yourself uh, to the airport authority. They will contact the Syrian embassy. They will get you a ticket and they will take you back to Syria. That's That was her advice to me. Well, not going back to Syria is the main thing I'm trying to avoid. Uh, and then I start fighting. That's what the system said. Uh, that's what tried to convince me that this is your right as, as a Syrian. And uh, uh, it has been, and there was a time when high rank officers from Malaysia uh, invited me for a meeting and they said, uh, that uh, we are uh, worried that people are going to follow your steps. And I said, they are going to follow my steps, not because I am uh, I'm, I'm their aspiration for them, no, because the system is broken and it's not working. And there will be a gaps on the system where people are running out of choices. Uh, so far, after I arrived to Canada, I dealt with 26 cases with people uh, stuck at airports, mainly in Malaysia and uh, Addis Ababa and uh, Philippines. So it is still happening. And that's why the system is ha has been designed for a brother. Which, uh, um, well, well it's, it's a very interesting topic. I don't want to go into details, but we are not the one who have uh, 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 troops, uh, army troops in, 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 at Washington borders. Washington have eight um, uh, military bases in Syria, and they are the one who is taking our uh, uh, resources, uh, including oil. And yet when it comes to uh, human rights, um, they, they look into profit, so we, are, we don't exist for them. So the system is not working. So the system is work working, but not for human rights, not for... Yeah, it, yeah the economical system that yeah. designed for a profit is working, mm -hmm. but the human rights system isn't working. Uh, I even faced that uh, before publishing my book. Um, uh, there are different types of delayness or limbos where I was stuck in a bureaucratic one. And then I 
stuck at the financial one uh, because I faced difficult time finding a publisher, for example with me being all over the news, all over the world. And it's a syllable story. And uh, people kept comparing me to the Tom Hanks movie. And yet uh, the publishers felt that it's safer to publish uh, how to, uh, to make a good hummus uh, or uh, how to have, what should we do when we have a bet or a dog or a cat? Or it's, it's an easy sell where with me, they will take a risk of not selling books. And I faced a problem. So the system is not working in so many different levels for us as refugees. And this is kind of why we're so keen to invite you, because this is essentially what our think tank programs focus on, is, is this, this kind of global dysfunction of, of many different, different aspects and areas, whether it's climate change or war or business or biodiversity. So my last question, because I know you have to be going by 8.40, is um, going to kind of quote for something that you wrote. Um, All these months in jails, police stations, detention centers, I never saw a white face or heard an English voice. Had none of them violated the labor or immigration laws? You write that there's a new form of discrimination. You write, for us, discrimination was no longer just about skin, color, and gender. It was geographical and nationalist, nationalist racism. Could you address that? Because I think this is, this is a huge contribution to understanding. It's something I thought myself, and, and you wrote this deal. Well, yeah, well, you lived in Dubai before, as you told me earlier. Uh, you know how the uh, the society is divided there, and what does it mean to be uh, uh, someone from UK or Sweden or America, and how the system is treating you differently. I discovered that uh, I, I never paid attention at the beginning to uh, uh, not having any white Englishman in, in the jail for us, but uh, there was a uh, a specific accident in one police station where he, the man who looked like uh, he, he was from UK or Scotland, I don't know, and uh, he, a uh, very tall white man, and he started shouting in, in the waiting room, I need my ambassador, I need the, everything, how you dare to, uh, to jail me, and they let him go by 3 a.m. when we waited at the same room for another 14 days, and that's when this, uh, it's for me, it's always the small stories who, uh, mm. which will bring the motive to start thinking about something, and that's when I kept asking myself after that for another three months in, in detention jail in UAE, then another two months in detention jail in Malaysia, that these guys never broke the law, uh, the law and uh, they do. Uh, but um, and this is not their fault. It's a good thing that uh, their government is backing them up because uh, um, they are powerful and they are uh, uh, people are or authorities, local authorities are afraid from them. But uh, in, uh, in Malaysia jail, when I was in the jail, uh, it was a small cell with more than 40 inmates uh, in, in five by six meters uh, cell uh, where we could not have a place uh, to sleep. I uh, slept for the first 20 days uh, while sitting and laying my back to, uh, to the wall. And uh, there I met people, uh, poor people who sold everything they have uh, in their home countries from Asia, mainly from Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, and uh, even the Rohingya refugees. And uh, uh, how could, and then I start feeling that these people did nothing wrong in their life except falling at the, at the wrong side of the world. Uh, that was their only crime. They are people with hope, with dignity, and with dreams, and yet the system has failed them. And uh, uh, that's when I thought that it's no longer about uh, skin only and color or religious. It's about, uh, uh, it's about being being uh, born in, at, the, at the wrong side. That's why my first tweet ever was, uh, what does it mean to be Syrian? Uh, it was never a personal story for me because at the airport, I discovered that uh, all what happened to me, it's not happening because I'm a criminal or a bad person. It's happening because I'm Hassan who is holding a Syrian passport. And that's why people are criminalizing me, are treating me in a different way. 
um, and, and uh, it's still happening. Uh, but, and I think even for the majority of, not the majority, for so many people in the Western countries uh, who are white, they are happy with that because it gives them a certain amount of privilege. Uh, they are happy with being a, a, a superior and uh, a, a, because it serves them and it serves their well. So that's what's going on. Well, keep living in Dubai, people even say if someone was Moroccan, born in Morocco, but they had a US passport, they received a different pay grade. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's, yeah, it's a very telling. It's very interesting how you bring this up where you are, the idea of where you're being, where you're born at. There was an article, oh, a while ago, I think in relation to the, the bombing in Boston, where a Chinese student died here in that attack. And uh, it was about, you know, where you die matters. Everyone heard about her story. But if she would have died in China, who would have cared? And the same thing is where you're, where you're born. Uh, you don't have access to power. You don't have, have access to, to basic legal systems. True, but there are so many things, uh, incidents and uh, crises are going uh, in the world at this time, which makes very hard to uh, to cover it all. Uh, even with the new generations, we have uh, uh, the fast life kind of uh, thing. They, um, the, the news will be there for a day or two. That's the circle of the news. And that's uh, after that, it's no longer a news. It's still happening in Afghanistan. And look mm -hmm. what, what happened there. So uh, people, they have their own misery. They have their own tragedy. And they felt that uh, they cannot change things and they cannot, uh, uh, they cannot do anything. So they move on because they don't want to affect their life in a negative way. And they want to live their life in a fun and joyful way. I, I, I agree with that. I want them to have fun and joy uh, in their life, but I want them to change their belief that they cannot do any change because they can. Uh, the, uh, the, to put some pressure and to change things uh, because it's unacceptable even what happened in Afghanistan. No one is speaking about Syria. Uh, it's, it's a very old news now, and um, but it's still happening, and refugee camps are more back than ever. Uh, the, the last statement 82 million displaced and refugee people we have this year 2020 so what's been happening in dara yeah recently exactly. somebody yeah. talks about or you know, we're going to have another event probably in december about the mental health crisis in northern <gasps> syria and and all the suicides that have been happening yeah. so well, we, we are, are people uh, for our mental health we uh we we are tough. We face life even before uh, the Syrian crisis. So the first time I heard about PTSD, and I agree, I, I have it. But uh, the first time I heard the terms PTSD was when I arrived to Canada. And, uh, what is that? Uh, they explained it to me. We, we face a problem and we deal it with it. Uh, uh, that, that's how life taught us since we were kids in Syria. So I want to open it up. For, for questions from the audience uh, before we have to close. We have a few more minutes left. If anybody has a question, you can either put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Or even a comment, you would like to comment on, you know, if you read the book and... Uh, everybody going to be shy. Yeah, well, that's normally the case. So. Okay, so then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have a question. Oh, sure, go ahead, oh. Mary. Yeah, hi, Hassan. Um, I guess my question is your adjustment to Canada. You've been there for a while now. Do you feel um, like this is your new home? Do you feel comfortable there? Do you feel safe there? Any, any kind of comment on living in Canada now? Yes, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> sorry. I, I even answered that at the book. Uh, whether I'm Syrian or Canadian, all what I was asking there before is uh, having a place where I can be permanently legal, where I can have a work to support myself financially, when I can feel uh, uh, my human rights or feeling uh, that I am having a voice and a value as an individual. Uh, Canada gave me all of 
of that. And um, uh, I'm still living the dream. And uh, uh, since day one, even before I was in, uh, I was arrived to Canada, I felt in love with this country and uh, I still do. Um, do I call it home? Yes, because I choose to. Um, I'm, I'm a Syrian by birth and um, it's a part of my DNA. Uh, I cannot change that. It's where, and I'm proud of it. Uh, it's where my, my family are, my memories, my school, my late father, uh, all my cousins, and uh, I will always miss it and be a part of it. But uh, Canada, what made me feel that I'm human and uh, I deserve better and I have a purpose in life uh, and uh, I'm meant to serve and uh, um, feel, feel the freedom. Canada gave me all of that and I choose to, uh, to make it a part of my DNA. Um, uh, I, I am uh, um, for the last year. I'm working with Red Cross, and I'm uh, moving uh, from city to city in different provinces and different uh, places, locations. I'm living in hotels since uh, since almost a year now. I'm speaking now from far the north. For, from St. John, which is 1,500 kilometer away from Vancouver. And um, do I love it? Yes, because I, I'm, I'm feeling that I'm being back to the community who uh, gave me a chance and accepted me. But uh, do I have, do I need to feel that I'm settling down uh, or I have my own space to call it home? I'm missing that for the last year. Uh, and it's putting me under a little bit of uh, uh, stress, but... Uh, uh, I'm fine with it because we all need to pay uh, a price. And uh, the last year was not easy for any of us. But uh, uh, am I grateful and thankful? Yes, and it's going to be forever. Right. Thank you. Very, yeah. very well said. Thank you. And your English is excellent, I think. So give oh, yourself you. a pat on the back. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We have time for one more. We? You know that I'm 10 minutes, yes, you know, eight, ten minutes eight, late for my one. Oh, eight oh, forty. That's, yeah. that's fine. It's okay. So we can go ahead and end it there. And and I just want to say, I think for me, the takeaway from from your book and from from this discussion is that we as individuals have some work to do. That if we don't like the system we currently see, that there are steps and measures and things that we can do to positively impact um, what's happening, particularly in migration. So thank, well, thank you so you. much, everyone, for joining well, us, Hassan. Truly was a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. Wishing Have you so day. much success in life. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate thank you. it. Have a good day. All of you. You too. Bye-bye.